Really excited about tonight's event because we do a lot of literary events here, um, but we don't get a lot of people who write um, in genres. And so I'm really excited to bring uh, Joe Hill here tonight. You guys got here so early, you know who he is, you're excited to meet him. So let's welcome him to the stage. Hey guys, how you doing? Uh, I want to thank the Center for Fiction for having me this evening. Um, it's a real thrill. I don't think I've ever read in Brooklyn before. Um, and uh, thanks to all you guys for, for coming out to support the book and listen to me blab. Um, so for the novels, when I've been on the road, generally what I've done is I've read for a couple minutes, then I talk and do a Q&A. We'll still have a Q&A. We'll still have time to talk. But because Full Throttle is a collection of short stories, I thought we should have a short story. Um, so I'm going to read you um, a, an abridged version of You Are Released, which is uh, uh, one of the last stories in the book. Um, uh, I, did, I did streamline, I did remove a couple narrative threads um, so that we could get it in in about a half an hour and still have some time to chat afterwards. Um, so, uh, so let's go ahead and jump right in. Let's go ahead and get to it. Okay. Greg Holder in business. Holder is on his third scotch and playing it cool about the famous woman sitting next to him when all the TVs in the cabin go black and a message in white block text appears on the screens. An announcement is in progress. Static hisses from the public address system. The pilot has a young voice, the voice of an uncertain teenager addressing a crowd at a funeral. Folks, this is Captain Waters. I've had a message from our team on the ground, and after thinking it over, it seems proper to share it with you. There's been an incident at Anderson Air Force Base in Guam, and the PA cuts out. There is a long, suspenseful silence. I am told, Waters continues abruptly, that U.S. Strategic Command is no longer in contact with our forces there or with the regional governor's office. There are reports from offshore that, that there was a flash, some kind of flash. Holder unconsciously presses himself back into his seat as if in response to a jolt of turbulence. What the hell does that mean? There was a flash. Flash of what? So many things can flash in this world. A girl can flash a bit of leg. A high roller can flash his money. Your whole life can flash before your eyes. Can Guam flash an entire island? Just say if they were nuked, please, murmurs the famous woman on his left in that well-bred, moneyed, honeyed voice of hers. Captain Waters continues, I'm sorry I don't know more, and what I do know is so... His voice trails off again. Appalling, the famous woman suggests. Disheartening, dismaying, shattering. Worrisome, Waters finishes. Fine, the famous woman says with a certain dissatisfaction. That's all we know right now, Waters says. We'll share more information with you as it comes in. At this time, we're cruising at 37,000 feet and we're about halfway through your flight. We should arrive in Boston a little ahead of schedule. There's a scraping sound and a sharp click, and the monitors start playing films again. About half the people in business class are watching the same superhero movie, Captain America throwing his shield like a steel-edged frisbee, cutting down grotesques that look like they just crawled out from under the bed. A black girl of about nine or ten sits across the aisle from Holder. She looks at her mother and says in a voice that carries, Where is Guam precisely? Her use of the word precisely tickles Holder. It's so teacherly and unchildlike. Her mother says, I don't know, sweetie. I think it's near Hawaii. She isn't looking at her daughter. She's glancing this way and that with a bewildered expression as if reading an invisible text for instructions. How to discuss a nuclear exchange with your child. It's closer to Taiwan, Holder says, leaning across the aisle to address the child. Just south of Korea, adds the famous woman. I wonder how many people live there, Holder says. The celebrity arches an eyebrow. You mean as of this moment? Based on the report we just heard, I should think very few. 
Leonard Waters in the cockpit. North Dakota is somewhere beneath them, but all Waters can see is a hilly expanse of cloud stretching to the horizon. Waters has never visited North Dakota, and when he tries to visualize it, imagines rusting antique farm equipment, Billy Bob Thornton, and furtive acts of buggery in grain silos. On the radio, the controller in Minneapolis instructs a 737 to ascend to flight level 360 and increase speed to Mach 78. Ever been to Guam? asks his first officer with a false, fragile cheer. Waters can hardly bear to look at her. She is so heartbreakingly beautiful. Face like that, she ought to be on magazine covers. Up until the moment he met her in the conference room at LAX, two hours before they flew, he didn't know anything about her except her name was Bronson. He had been picturing someone like the guy in the original Death Wish. Been to Hong Kong, Waters says, wishing she wasn't so terribly lovely. Waters is in his mid-forties and looks about 19, a slim man with red hair cut to a close bristle and a map of freckles on his face. He is only just married and soon to be a father. A photo of his gourd-ripe wife in a sundress has been clipped to the dash. He doesn't want to be attracted to anyone else. He feels ashamed of even spotting a handsome woman. At the same time, he doesn't want to be cold, formal, distant. He's proud of his airline for employing more female pilots, wants to approve, to support. All gorgeous women are an affliction upon his soul. Sydney, Taiwan, not Guam, though. Me and friends used to free dive off Phi Phi Beach. Once I got close enough to a black tip shark to pet it, free diving naked is the only thing better than flying. The word naked goes through him like a jolt from a joy buzzer. That's his first reaction. His second reaction is that, of course, she knows Guam. She's ex-Navy, which is where she learned to fly. When he glances at her side long, he's shocked to find tears in her eyelashes. Kate Bronson catches his gaze and gives him a crooked, embarrassed grin that shows the slight gap between her two front teeth. He tries to imagine her with a shaved head and dog tags. It isn't hard. For all her cover girl looks, there is something slightly feral underneath, something wiry and reckless about her. I don't know why I'm crying. I haven't been there in ten years. It's not like I have any friends there. Waters considers several possible reassuring statements and discards each in turn. There is no kindness in telling her it might not be as bad as she thinks, when, in fact, it is likely to be far worse. There's a rap at the door. Bronson hops up, wipes her cheeks with the back of her hand, glances through the peephole, turns the bolts. It's Vorstenbosch, the senior flight attendant, a plump, feet man with wavy blonde hair, a fussy manner, and small eyes behind his thick gold-framed glasses. He's calm, professional, and pedantic when sober, and a potty mouth swishy delight when drunk. Did someone nuke Guam? He asks without preamble. I don't have anything from the ground except we've lost contact, Waters says. What's that mean specifically, Vorstenbosch asks. I've got a plane load of very frightened people and nothing to tell them. Bronson thumps her head, ducking behind the controls to sit back down. Waters pretends not to see. He pretends not to notice her hands are shaking. It means, Waters begins, but there's an alert tone, and then the controller is on with a message for everyone in ZMP airspace. The voice from Minnesota is sandy, smooth, untroubled. He might be talking about nothing more important than a region of high pressure. They're taught to sound that way. This is Minneapolis Center with high priority instructions for all aircraft on this frequency. Be advised we have received instructions from U.S. Strategic Command to clear this airspace for operations from Ellsworth. We will begin directing all flights to the closest appropriate airport. Repeat, we are grounding all commercial and recreational aircraft in the ZMP. Please remain alert and ready to respond promptly to our instructions. There is a momentary hiss. And then, with what sounds like real regret, Minneapolis adds, Sorry about this, ladies and gents. Uncle Sam needs the sky this afternoon for an unscheduled world war. Ellsworth Airport, Forston Bosch says. What do they have at Ellsworth Airport? The 28th Bomb Wing, Bronson says, rubbing her head. Veronica Darcy in business. The plane banks steeply and Veronica Darcy looks straight down at the rumpled duvet of cloud beneath. Shafts of blinding sunshine stab through the windows on the other side of the cabin. The good-looking drunk beside her, he has a loose lock of dark hair on his brow that makes her think of Cary Grant, of Clark Kent, 
unconsciously squeezes his armrests. She wonders if he's a white-knuckle flyer or just a boozer. He had his first scotch as soon as they reached cruising altitude three hours ago, just after 10 a.m. And the screens go black and another announcement is in progress. Veronica shuts her eyes to listen, focusing the way she might at a table read as an a another actor reads lines for the first time. Captain Waters, voiceover. Hello, passengers. Captain Waters again. I'm afraid we have had an unexpected request from air traffic control to reroute to Fargo and put down at Hector International Airport. We've been asked to clear this airspace effective immediately. Uneasy beat. Uh, for military maneuvers. Obviously, the situation in Guam has created uh, complications for everyone in the sky today. There's no reason for alarm, but we are going to have to put down. We expect to be on the ground in Fargo in 40 minutes. I'll have more information for you as it comes in. Beep. My apologies, folks. This isn't the afternoon any of us was hoping for. If it were a movie, the captain wouldn't sound like a teenage boy going through the worst of adolescence. They would have cast someone gruff and authoritative. Hugh Jackman, maybe. maybe. Or Brit, if they wanted to suggest erudition, hint of Oxford-acquired wisdom. Derek Jacobi, perhaps. Veronica has acted alongside Derek off and on for almost 30 years. He held her backstage the night her mother died and talked her through it in a gentle, reassuring murmur. An hour later, they were both dressed as Romans in front of 480 people, and God, he was good that night, and she was good too, and that was the evening she learned she could act her way through anything, and she can act her way through this too. Inside, she is already growing calmer, letting go of all cares, all concern. It has been years since she felt anything she didn't decide to feel first. I thought you were drinking too early, she says to the man beside her. It turns out I started drinking too late. She lifts the little plastic cup of wine she was served with her lunch and says, chin chin, before draining it. He turns a lovely, easy smile upon her. I've never been to Fargo, although I did watch the TV show. He narrows her eyes. He narrows his eyes. Were you in Fargo? I feel like you were. You did something with forensics, and then you and McGregor strangled you to death? No, darling. You're thinking of contract murder, and it was James McAvoy with a garrote. So it was. I knew I saw you die once. Do you die a lot? Oh, all the time. I did a picture with Richard Harris. It took him all day to bludgeon me to death with a candlestick. Five setups, 40 takes... The poor man was exhausted by the end of it. Her seatmate's eyes bulge, and she knows he's seen the picture and remembers her role. She was 22 at the time and naked in every scene. No exaggeration. Veronica's daughter once asked, Mom, when exactly did you discover clothing? Veronica had replied, Right after you were born, darling. Veronica's daughter is beautiful enough to be in movies herself, but she makes hats instead. When Veronica thinks of her, her chest aches with pleasure. She never deserved to have such a sane, happy, grounded daughter. When Veronica considers herself, when she reckons with her own selfishness and narcissism, her indifference to mothering, her preoccupation with her career, it seems impossible that she could have such a good person in her life. I'm Greg, says her neighbor, Greg Holder. Veronica Darcy, what brought you to L.A.? Part? Or do you live here? Or do you live there? I had to be there for the apocalypse. I play a wise old woman of the wasteland. I assume it will be a wasteland. All I saw was a green screen. I hope the real apocalypse will hold off long enough for the film to come out. Do you think it will? Greg looks out at the landscape of cloud. Sure. It's North Korea, not China. What can they hit us with? No apocalypse for us. For them, maybe. How many people live in North Korea? This from the girl on the other side of the aisle, the one with the comically huge glasses. She has been listening to them intently and is leaning toward them now in a very adult way. Her mother gives Greg and Veronica a tight smile and pats her daughter's arm. Don't disturb the other passengers, dear. She's not disturbing me, Greg says. I don't know, kid, but a lot of them live on farms scattered across the countryside. There's only the one big city, I think. Whatever happens, I'm sure most of them will be okay. The girl sits back and considers this, then twists in her seat to whisper to her mother. Her mother squeezes her eyes shut and shakes her head. Veronica wonders if she even knows she is still patting her daughter's arm. I have a girl about her age, Greg says. 
I have a girl about your age, Veronica tells him. She's my favorite thing in the world. Ah, oh, me too. My daughter, I mean, not yours. I'm sure yours is swell. Are you headed home to her? Yes, my wife called to ask if I would cut a business trip short. My wife is in love with a man she met on Facebook, and she wants me to come take care of the kid so she can drive up to Toronto to meet him. Oh my God, you're not serious. Did you have any warning? I thought she was spending too much time online, but to be fair, she thought I was spending too much time being drunk. I guess I'm an alcoholic. I guess I might have to do something about that now. I think I'll start by finishing this. And he swallows the last of his scotch. Veronica has been divorced twice and has always been keenly aware that she herself was the primary agent of domestic ruin. When she thinks about how badly she behaved, how badly she used Robert and Francois, she feels ashamed and angry at herself, and so she is naturally glad to offer sympathy and solidarity to the wronged man beside her. I'm so sorry. What a terrible bomb to have dropped on you. What did you say? Asked the girl across the aisle, leaning toward them again. Are we going to drop a nuclear bomb on them? She sounds more curious than afraid, but at this, her mother exhales a sharp, panicked breath. Greg leans toward the child again, smiling in a way that is both kindly and wry. And Veronica suddenly wishes she were 20 years younger. She might have been good for a fellow like him. I don't know what the military options are, so I couldn't say for sure. But before you can finish, the cabin fills with a nerve-shredding sonic howl. An airplane slashes past, then two more flying in tandem. One is so near off the port wing that Veronica catches a glimpse of the man in the cockpit, helmeted, face cupped in some kind of breathing apparatus. These aircraft bear scant resemblance to the 777 carrying them east. These are immense iron falcons the gray hue of bullet tips, of lead. The force of their passing causes the whole airliner to shudder. Passengers scream, grab each other. The punishing sound of the bombers crossing their path can be felt intestinally in the bowels. Then they're gone, having raked long contrails across the bright blue. Shocked, shaken silence follows. Veronica Darcy looks at Greg Holder and sees he has smashed his plastic cup, made a fist and broken it into flinders. He notices what he's done at the same time and laughs and puts the wreckage on the armrest. Then he turns back to the little girl and finishes his sentence as if there had been no interruption. But I'd say all signs point to yes. Mark Vorstenbosch in the cockpit. Vorstenbosch feels nauseated and steps into the head long enough to steady himself. The cabin smells of vomit and fear, fore and aft. Children weep inconsolably. The senior flight attendant has seen two women praying. He touches his hair, washes his hands, draws one deep breath after another. Forsten Bosch's role model has always been the Anthony Hopkins character from The Remains of the Day, a film he has never seen as a tragedy, but rather as an economium to a life of disciplined service. Forsten Bosch sometimes wishes he was British. He recognized Veronica Darcy in business right away, but his professionalism requires him to resist acknowledging her celebrity. When he has composed himself, he exits the head and begins making his way to the cockpit. He pauses in business to tend to a woman who is hyperventilating. When Vorstenbosch takes her hand, he is reminded of the last time he held his grandmother's hand. At the time, she was in her coffin, and her fingers were just as cold and lifeless. Thorsten Bosch feels a quavering indignation when he thinks about the bombers, those idiotic hot dogs, blasting by so close to the plane. Their lack of simple human consideration sickens him. He practices deep breathing with the woman and assures her they'll be on the ground soon. The cockpit is filled with sunshine and calm. He isn't surprised. Everything about the work is designed to make even a crisis, and this is a crisis, albeit one they never practiced in the flight simulators, a matter of routine, of checklists, and proper procedure. The first officer is a scamp of a girl who brought a brown bag lunch onto the plane with her. When her left sleeve was hiked up, Vorstenbosch glimpsed part of a tattoo, a white lion just above the wrist. He looks at her and sees in her past a trailer park, a brother hooked on opioids, divorced parents, a first job in Walmart, a desperate escape to the military. He likes her immensely. How could he not? His own childhood was much the same, only instead of escaping to the army, he went to New York to be queer. 
When she let him into the cockpit last time, she was trying to hide tears, a fact that twists forced in Bosch's heart. Nothing distresses him quite like the distress of others. What's happening? Forstin Bosch asks. On the ground in ten, says Bronson. Maybe, Water says. They've got half a dozen planes stacked up ahead of us. Any word from the other side of the world, Forstin Bosch wants to know. For a moment, neither replies. Then, in a stilted, distracted voice, Water says, The U.S. Geological Survey reports a seismic event in Guam that registered about 6.3 on the Richter scale. That would correspond to 250 kilotons, Bronson says. It was warhead, Borston Bosch says. It's not quite a question. Something happened in Pyongyang, too, Bronson says. An hour before Guam, state television switched over to color bars. There's intelligence about a whole bunch of high-ranking officials being killed within minutes of one another. So we're either talking a palace coup, or we tried to bring down the leadership with some surgical assassinations, and they didn't take it too well. What can we do for you, Forston Bosch? says Waters. There was a fight in coach. One man poured beer on another. Oh, for fuck's sake, Waters says. They've been warned, but we might want Fargo PD on hand when we put down. I believe the victim is going to want to file charges. I told you there was a bunch of stuff in this story that I had to cut out. Uh, radio Fargo, but no promises. I get the feeling the airport is going to be a madhouse. Security might have their hands full. There's also a woman in business having a panic attack. She's trying not to scare her daughter, but she's having trouble breathing. I have her huffing into an air sickness bag. But I'd like emergency services to meet her with an oxygen tank when we get down. Done. Anything else? There are a dozen other mini crises unfolding, but the team has it in hand. There is one other thing. I suppose. Would either of you like a glass of beer or wine in violation of all regulations? They glance back at him. Bronson grins. I want to have your baby, Vorsten Bosch, she says. We would make a lovely child. Ditto, Waters says. That's a yes. Waters and Bronson look at each other. Better not, Bronson decides, and Waters nods. Then the captain adds, but I'll have the coldest Dos Equis you can find as soon as we're parked. You know my fa what my favorite thing about flying is, Bronson asks. It's always a sunny day up this high. It seems impossible anything so awful could be happening on such a sunny day. They are all admiring the cloudscape when the white and fluffy floor beneath them is lanced through a hundred times. A hundred pillars of white smoke thrust themselves into the sky, rising from all around. It's like a magic trick, as if the clouds had hidden quills that have suddenly erupted up and out. A moment later, the thunderclap hits them, and with it, turbulence, and the plane is kicked, knocked up, into one side. A dozen red lights stammer on the dash. Alarms shriek. Vorstenbosch sees it all in an instant as he is lifted off his feet. For a moment, Vorstenbosch floats, suspended like a parachute, a man made of silk and filled with air. His head clubs the wall. He drops so hard and fast, it's as if a trap door has opened in the floor of the cockpit and plunged him into the bright fathoms of the sky beneath. Judy Mumford in business. Mom, Judy shouts. Mom, look it. What's that? What's happening in the sky is less alarming than what's happening in the cabin. Someone is screaming. A bright silver thread of sound that stitches itself right through Judy's head. Adults groan in a way that makes Judy think of ghosts. The 777 tilts to the left and then rocks suddenly hard to the right. The plane sails through a labyrinth of gargantuan pillars, the cloisters of some impossibly huge cathedral. Judy had to spell cloisters, an easy one, in the Englewood Regional. Her mother, Millie, doesn't reply. She's breathing steadily into a white paper bag. Millie has never flown before, has never been out of California. Neither has Judy, but unlike her mother, she was looking forward to both. Judy has always wanted to go up in a big airplane. She'd also like to dive in a submarine someday, although she'd settle for a ride in a glass-bottom kayak. The orchestra of despair and horror sinks away to a soft diminuendo. Judy spelled diminuendo in the first round of the state finals and came this close to blowing it and absorbing a humiliating early defeat. Judy leans toward the nice-looking man who has been drinking iced tea the whole trip. Were those rockets? Judy asks. The woman from the movies replies, speaking in her adorable British accent. Judy has only ever heard British accents in films, and she loves them. ICBMs, says the movie star. They're on their way to the other side of the world. 
Judy notices the movie star is holding hands with the much younger man who drank all the iced tea. Her features are set in an expression of almost icy calm. The man beside her, on the other hand, looks like he wants to throw up. He's squeezing the older woman's hand so hard his knuckles are white. Are you two related? Judy asks. She can't think why else they might be holding hands. No, says the nice-looking man. Then why are you holding hands? Because we're scared, says the movie star, although she doesn't look scared. And it makes us feel better. Oh, Judy says, and then quickly takes her mother's free hand. Her mother looks at her gratefully over the bag that keeps inflating and deflating like a paper lung. Judy glances back at the nice-looking man. Would you like to hold my hand? Yes, please, the man says, and they take each other's hand across the aisle. What's ICBM stand for? Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, the man says. That's one of my words. I had to spell intercontinental in the regional. For real? I don't think I can spell intercontinental off the top of my head. Oh, it's easy, Judy says, and proves it by spelling it for him. I'll take your word for it. You're the expert. I'm going to Boston for a spelling bee. It's international semifinals, and if I do well there, I get to go to Washington, D.C., and be on television. I didn't think I'd ever go to either of those places, but then I didn't think I'd ever go to Fargo either. Are we still landing at Fargo? I don't know what else we do, says the nice-looking man. How many ICBMs was that? Judy asks, craning her neck to look out at the towers of smoke. All of them, says the movie star. Judy says, I wonder if we're going to miss the spelling bee. This time it is her mother who responds. Her voice is hoarse, as if she has a sore throat or has been crying. I'm afraid we might, sweetie. Oh, Judy says. Oh, no. She feels a little like she did when they had Secret Santa last year, and she was the only girl who didn't get a gift because her Secret Santa was Martin Cohassi, and Martin was out with mononucleosis. You would have won, her mother says, and shuts her eyes. Not just the semifinals, either. They aren't till tomorrow night, Judy says. Maybe we could get another plane in the morning. I'm not sure anyone will be flying tomorrow morning, says the nice-looking man apologetically. Because of something happening in North Korea? No, her friend across the aisle says, not because of something that's going to happen there. Millie opens her eyes and says, shh, you'll scare her. But Judy isn't scared. She just doesn't understand. The man across the aisle swings her hand back and forth, back and forth. What's the hardest word you ever spell? Spelled, he asks. Anthropocene, Judy says promptly. That's the word I lost on last year at semis. I thought it had an I in it. It means in the era of human beings, as in the Anthropocene era looks very short when compared to other geological periods. The man stares at her for a moment and then barks with laughter. You said it, kid. The movie star stares out her window at the enormous white columns. No one has ever seen a sky like this, these towers of cloud. The bright, sprawling day caged in its bars of smoke. They look like they're holding up heaven. What a lovely afternoon. You might soon get to see me perform another death, Mr. Holder. I'm not sure I can promise to play the part with my usual flair. She shuts her eyes. I miss my daughter. I don't think I'm going to get to... She opens her eyes and looks at Judy. Falls quiet. I've been thinking the same thing about mine, says Mr. Holder. Then he turns his head and peers past Judy at her mother. You know how lucky you are. He glances from Millie to Judy and back, and when Judy looks, her mother is nodding, a small gesture of acknowledgement. Why are you lucky, Mom? Judy asks her. Millie kisses her temple. Because we're together today, silly bean. Oh, Judy says. It's hard to see the luck in that. They're together every day. At some point, Judy realizes the nice-looking man has let go of her hand, and when she next looks over, he is holding the movie star in his arms, and she is holding him, and they are kissing each other quite tenderly, and Judy is shocked, just shocked, because the movie star is a lot older than her seatmate. They're kissing just like lovers at the end of the film, right before the credits roll, and everyone has to go home. It's so outrageous, Judy just has to laugh. Kate Bronson in the cockpit. By the time Kate finishes field dressing Vorsten Bosch's head injury, the flight attendant is groaning, stretched out on the cockpit floor. 
She tucks his glasses into his shirt pocket. The left lens was cracked in the fall. I have never, ever lost my footing, Vorstrom Boss says. In 20 years of doing this, I am the Fred effing Astaire of the skies. No, the Grace effing Kelly. I can do the work of all other flight attendants, but backwards and in heels. Kate says, I've never seen a Fred Astaire film. I was always more of a Sly Stallone girl. Surf, Vorstenbosch says. Right to the bone, Kate agrees and squeezes his hand. Don't try and get up. Not yet. Kate springs lightly to her feet and slips into the seat beside Waters. When the missiles launched, the imaging system lit up with bogeys, a hundred red pinpricks and more. But there's nothing now except the other planes in the immediate vicinity. Most of the other aircraft are behind them, still circling Fargo. Captain Waters turned them to a new heading while Kate tended to Vorstenbosch. What's going on, she asks. His face alarms her. He's so waxy, he's almost colorless. It's all happening, he says. The president has been moved to a secure location. The cable news says Russia launched. Why, she asks, as if it matters. He shrugs helplessly, but then replies, Russia or China are both put defenders in the air to turn back our bombers before they could get to Korea. A sub in the South Pacific responded by striking a Russian aircraft carrier. And then, and then, so, Kate says, no Fargo. Where? Kate can't seem to load more than a single word at a time. There is an airless tight sensation behind her breastbone. There must be somewhere north we can land away from from what's coming down behind us. There must be somewhere that isn't a threat to anyone. Nunavut, maybe? They landed a 777 at Iqala last year. Short little runway at the end of the world, but it's technically possible, and we might have enough fuel to make it. Silly me, Kate says. I didn't think to pack a winter coat. He says, you must be new to long-haul flying. You never know where they're going to send you, so you always make sure to have a swimsuit and mittens in your bag. She is new to long-haul flying. She attained her 777 rating just six months ago. But she doesn't think Waters' tip is worth taking to heart. Kate doesn't think she'll ever fly another commercial aircraft. Neither will Waters. There won't be anywhere to fly to. Kate isn't going to see her mother, who lives in Pennsylvania, ever again. That's no loss. Her mother will bake, along with the stepfather who tried to put a hand on the front of Kate's Wranglers when she was 14. When Kate told her mom what he had tried to do, her mother said it was her own fault for dressing like a slut. Kate will also never see her 12-year-old half-brother again, and that does make her sad. Liam is sweet, peaceful, and autistic. Kate got him a drone for Christmas, and his favorite thing in the world is to send it aloft to take aerial photographs. She understands the appeal. It has always been her favorite part of getting airborne, too. That moment when the houses shrink to the size of models on a train set. Trucks the size of ladybugs gleam and flash as they slide frictionless along the highways. Altitude reduces lakes to the size of flashing silver hand mirrors. From a mile up, a whole town is small enough to fit in the cup of your palm. Her half-brother Liam says he wants to be little, like the people in the pictures he takes with his drone. He says if he was as small as them, Kate could put him in her pocket and take him with her. They soar over the northernmost edge of North Dakota, gliding in the way she once sliced through the bathwater warm seas off Phi Phi Beach through the glassy, bright gleam of the, Pacific, gleam of the Pacific. How good that felt to sail as if weightless above the ocean world beneath. To be free of gravity is, she thinks, to feel what it must be like to be pure spirit, to escape the flesh itself. Minneapolis calls out to them. Delta 236, you are off course. You are about to vacate our airspace. What's your heading? Minneapolis, Water says, our heading is 060, permission to redirect to Yankee Fox, Foxtrot Bravo, Iquila Airport. Delta 236, why can't you land at Fargo? Waters bends over the controls for a long time. A drop of sweat plinks on the dash. His gaze shifts briefly, and Kate sees him looking at the photograph of his wife. Minneapolis, Fargo is a first strike location. We'll have a better chance north. There are 247 souls on board. The radio crackles. And Minneapolis considers. There is a snap of intense brightness, almost blinding, as if a flashbulb the size of the sun has gone off somewhere in the sky behind the plane. Kate turns her head away from the windows and shuts her eyes. There is a deep, muffled bump, felt more than heard. A 
kind of existential shudder in the frame of the aircraft. When Kate looks up again, there are green blotchy after images drifting in front of her eyeballs. It's like diving fi-fi again. She is surrounded by neon fronds and squirming fluorescent jellyfish. Kate leans forward and cranes her neck. Something is glowing under the cloud cover, possibly as much as a hundred miles away behind them. The cloud itself is beginning to deform and expand, bulging upward. As she settles back into her seat, there is another deep, jarring, muffled crunch, another burst of light. The inside of the cockpit momentarily becomes a negative image of itself. This time she feels a flash of heat against the right side of her face, as if someone switched a sun lamp on and off. Minneapolis says, copy Delta 236, contact Winnipeg Center 127.3. The air traffic controller speaks with an almost casual indifference. The boss sits up. I'm seeing flashes. Us too, Kate says. Oh my God, Water says. His voice cracks. I should have tried to call my wife. Why didn't I try to call my wife? She's five months pregnant. She's all alone. You can't, Kate says. You couldn't. Why didn't I call and tell her? Water says, as if he hasn't heard. She knows, Kate tells him. She already knows. Whether they are talking about love or the apocalypse, Kate couldn't say. Another flash. Another deep, resonant, meaningful thump. Call now, Winnipeg, F-I-R, says Minneapolis. Call now, Nav Canada, Delta 236, you are released. Copy, Minneapolis, Kate says, because Waters has his face in his hands and is making tiny anguish sounds and can't speak. Thank you. Take care of yourselves, boys. This is Delta 236. We're gone. For more stories of unbridled optimism, um, you'll have to refer to your copies of Full Throttle. Um, I, no, in, in all seriousness, they're not all as bad as that. Some are worse. Um, so, so the way this works is now we, we slide into our Q&A portion of the evening, um, and I am happy to answer whatever questions you may have for me, whether you want to talk about the books, the new collection of short stories, some of the comic book stuff, the TV stuff, or, or you know, relationship advice, um, whatever. Actually, I say that sometimes, the relationship advice thing, because it's kind of a funny line. Then I was in Denver a couple years ago, and this 20-year-old kid stood up, and he was like slathered in sweat. And he goes, Mr. Hill, I've met this girl, and she's the one. And I, I don't want to screw this up. Do you have any advice for me? And I'm like, what the fuck? Because, you know, because it's just a funny line. I don't really mean it. You know, and I'm like, oh, my God. Uh, you know, and I'm on the spot. I got to come up with something. And so what I said is, uh, you know, don't send her any dick pics. You know, because no matter how good an idea it seems after three beers, it, it's just, she's not sitting there like, boy, I hope tonight's my lucky night. You know? <laughs> So, um, yeah, uh, whatever, whatever you want to do. I mean, the other thing I would advise you about is, you know, um, um, I've been, you know, I did my first public appearance for a book. In 2007, it was in front of a hometown crowd in Exeter, New Hampshire. I had never really spoken in front of a bunch of people before. And there was hometown, I mean, 120 people there or something. I was scared shitless, you know. I had no spit or anything and totally nervous and... You know, that first book, Heart Shaped Box, is about a heavy metal musician in, on the downslope of his career. He's in his 60s. You know, he's kind of had it all. You know, the, the, the platinum albums, played arenas, and, you know, and, but there's not much left for him now. And he's got a collection of grotesque oddities. Um, he's got, like, a tree pan human skull. He's got a witch's confession. He's got a snuff film. 
and uh, he decides to buy, he hears about a woman selling a ghost online, and he decides to buy it for his collection. And like, if you've seen even a single horror film in your life, you know this is a terrible idea. Um, and he, it is, and he spends the next 300 pages regretting it. Um, but so, so Jude, my heavy metal musician, has a younger sort of groupie girlfriend, and their relationship is not good. Their relationship is on the rocks. And I was going to read this portion at like 8 in, e eight in the evening, and it's, the language is pretty salty, you know? And, but at 8 in the evening, I look out at a whole, whole crowd of grown-ups, and I thought, I'm just going to go for it. I'm just going to read it like I wrote it. So she says to him, you're a sympathetic son of a bitch, you know that? And he says, you want sympathy? Go fuck James Taylor! The second after I said it, eight little kids appeared in the crowd. At least eight. It was like it was like uh, mushrooms after a rain, and the kids were the kids were like, and their parents were. But the moral that I felt good—that's the important thing. And, and so the moral of this story is, is if you did bring small children to tonight's event, I can't be on the hook for your bad parenting. Um, that's on you. So, so the other thing I was going to say is I have these lovely giveaways. I have Full Throttle has a bunch of, you know, it's got like a big motorcycle story in it and stuff. And so I've got these like, you know, I've got these keychains and stuff. So we'll give them to people who ask questions. So you've got to be brave or, or I'm going to have to go home with like 40 like motorcycle keychains, which is 39 more than I need. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and go for it. You, sir. What authors do I like to read for pleasure? I'm reading a good one now here, uh, if you could. I'm reading a good one now um, with my wife. I, I figured this out. So I keep a book diary, and um, I keep track of everything I read. And then recently I started putting tags next to them, like Pacey, Crime, Short, um, Red with Jillian, who's my wife. And then I, I did like a data, like I crunched the data, and I figured out what my favorite genre of fiction is. My favorite genre are books my wife and I read to each other. Um, so we're reading one together it, right now. We're about 60 pages from the ending. It's called The Institute. And it's a, <laughs> it's, it's a propulsive, it's a tremendously propulsive thriller. And when I finish... <laughs> When I finish, I'm, 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 you know, I'm going to hit the local bookstore and see if he's done anything else. Um, because I'm just, I'm completely charmed. You, sir, in, yeah, in the, in the cap. Um, so, I noticed in a lot of your earlier stories, I tend to have very positive endings. And short stories, like the one you just read, and, and uh, some in your previous book, tend to be a little bit darker and a little bit less happy. Is that a certain yeah, I mean, I, I was, when I started, I was full of hope, um, you know, and then in the last, it's hard to trace the exact moment when my heart began to wither and shrink, probably at some point in the last two years, but I can't think what event might have kicked it off. Um, who can fathom these things? Yes, sir, you in the gray shirt, I think it's a gray shirt. Yeah. So, um, so I wrote a book called NOS 4A2, um, which is a vanity license plate. When you sound it out, it spells the word Nosferatu, the German word for vampire. Um, that's about uh, a bad fellow uh, named Charlie Manx who has a car that runs on human souls instead of gasoline. And um, it was made into a really cool TV show on AMC. Um, starring Zachary Quinto as Charlie and Ashley Cummings as Vic McQueen. Vic McQueen has a, is a young woman with a mean machine of her own and a, a cult power to go with it. And in the book, she takes on Charlie over the course of 20 years and tries to stop a series, his, the child abductions that he commits to survive because he's sort of draining the souls out of children. Um, and the show turned out really well, and, uh, and um, you know, they're filming the second season right now. And I, I really like the first season, and I think the second season is going to be even better based on what I've read. So that, it's been pretty exciting. Um, uh, in, in the story, so Charlie, Charlie takes kids for a ride in his Rolls Royce race, 
And over the course of the miles, he's sucking the soul out of them to feed his own energy. And when he's done with them, they're these grinning ghouls, you know, with a head full of fangs. And he dumps these monstrous children in an other, a place that does not exist in our reality called Christmas Land, um, where every day is Christmas and unhappiness is against the law. And the kids ar run around the amusement park playing, you know, um, uh, games like Scissors for the Drifter. Um, and, and Vic also has a place, she calls it an inscape, called the Shortaway Bridge. And un unlike most bridges which span a river, um, this bridge spans the distance between lost and found. So if there's something she's looking for, um, she can head out on her Triumph Bonneville and find this imaginary bridge and cross it. And even if, she, even if what she's looking for is 2,000 miles away, she'll come out two minutes later on the other side. Um, at one point, we see a map, and it's in the TV show, and it's in the book as well. There is a map of the United Inscapes of America, and there are several locales on it. Um, there's the Treehouse of the Mind, which is a location in my second novel, Horns. There's the Lovecraft Keyhole, which is a reference to uh, my comic, Lock and Key. Um, there's the St. Nick Parkway, the Night Road, uh, Christmas Land, the Shortaway Bridge. Uh, the Pennywise Circus, and a place called Orphanhenge. Um, and I have a great idea for a novel called Orphanhenge. I'm no closer to writing it than I was when you asked me this question two years ago. So maybe one of these days. Way, 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 way in the back. Just so we right actually do yeah. have a handheld microphone that we can use. I'm sure we've all seen It Chapter 2, and your father had a pretty cool cameo in it. Is yeah. there any truth to the rumor of uh, a flashback where you played your father as the shopkeeper? Right. Um, so there's a movie out. Um, there's a movie out. It's a sequel. In a couple of years ago, Andy Muschietti, an Argentinian director, well known for his horror films, took a left hand turn and he made a family film about a gang of kids who meet a magical clown who leads them on exciting adventures, uh, exciting educational adventures in their small town. And so the sequel came out recently and it's based on a book that my dad wrote and he is the owner of a junk shop. And at one point, um, Andy Muschietti asked if I would play the younger version of my dad who bought something from the kids in It, and then we meet the older version later when the kid shows up to try to buy it back. Uh, you know, the thing is, is It Chapter 2 ran to two hours and 40 minutes, and they just couldn't cram in one more minute. And so my, my part wound up never getting filmed. I mean, it was scripted, but didn't, it didn't get in there. Um, I know I, I've become good friends with Andy and Barbara Muschietti, who made It, for a variety of reasons that sort of exist outside of It. Um, and, and it's my hope that they will take it chapter one and it chapter two and bind them together. And, and, um, Andy filmed another hour and a half of material. Um, and my dad has talked about wanting to write a 45 minute episode for a prequel that talks about when Pennywise first appeared. And my feeling is all that material would make a great Netflix show. That they ought to, you know, and, and Quentin Tarantino has talked about doing the same thing He's with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. The problem is, is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was already an hour and a half too long, and I, I can't imagine wanting to squeeze in any more. But it feels like it could have more, like that we would love to have more, and I think it would be as great as, you know, any season of Stranger Things. So maybe that'll happen, and, and if that does, I'm certainly willing to come and film the part. Then, you know, just give me a call. Yeah. Did you get your key ring? You did? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, unpublished, unpublished writers trying to get into the industry. Um, I mean, things have changed since I was trying to break in. You know, when I, when I was, I knew I wanted to be a writer as young as 13. And, but in college, um, and some of you have probably heard me talk about this before, but in college, I decided to drop my last name and write as Joe Hill um, because I had this fear of getting published as Joseph Kang um, and having a not very good novel or something come out because I had a famous father. And for my own, my own mental security, um, I needed to know when I sold a story, I sold it for the right reasons because an editor liked it. Um, uh, you know, you can get published on someone's coattails, um, but readers are pretty smart. 
You know, they might buy your first book because you have a famous daddy. If it's no good, they won't buy the second one. You know, and I, I definitely was selfish enough to want a long career. So I wrote as Joe Hill for about a decade, and I, I wrote four novels that I was never able to sell. Um, in particular, I remember one, The Fear Tree, I spent three years on, and then I sent it out and it was turned down by every publisher in New York, every publisher in London, and then for a final cruel kick in the nuts, every publisher in Canada, which, <laughs> which is a reminder to us all that no matter how low you fall, there's always lower. <laughs> um, um, eventually I did, I did break in in the sense of I, I started to write successful short stories and I, I you know, um, they were published in little magazines, a lot of them were published in British fantasy magazines. Um, I, I won a couple prizes, little liter not big deal prizes, but little low-key literary prizes. I got in a best of collection. Um, and then I had my big breakthrough, which was not selling a novel. It was, there was a talent scout at Marvel Comics who read one of my stories and invited me to write an 11-page Spider-Man. And that was my big professional breakthrough. Um, and it was all like kind of like a long time ago. Like I don't really know. There was no, for example, there's this huge ebook market now, and a lot of people self-publish ebooks. If that had existed, I might have been tempted to write to to self-publish the book that was turned down by all those publishers, um, which I think would have been a mistake. You know, I mean, it was a really good book in many ways, but it also had problems. There was still stuff I needed to learn. So in some ways, my my pen name protected me, as I hoped it would, by making sure the work, work was strictly judged on its merits. Um, so I don't know if I have any publishing advice, because it's a totally different world from when I started. My writing advice, my writing advice would be, never sit down in the morning to write a novel. Never sit down to write a short story. It's just too intimidating. It's just too much. You know, sit down to write one good scene. That's the whole job. Just a, a novel is just a big stack of good scenes. And a short story is just between one and three good scenes. That's really it. Um, you don't need to waste any time writing a scene where the protagonist wakes up, looks at himself in the mirror, brushes his teeth, picks out his clothes, and then looks in the fridge for something to eat. Unless there's a severed head in the fridge. <laughs> then it's interesting. Otherwise, it's not really a scene. It's just a guy doing stuff. In the Hawaiian shirt. Hey. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for coming out. Yeah, sure. Um, Oh. I, I just wanted piece. to talk a little bit about Charlie Manx. I think he's an interesting character. And what would the seed, I guess, of this... Because you could look at it from his point of view. He is doing a good thing. He's taking children away from these horrible parents. Yeah. Right? And putting them... In, I think I would not mind living in Christmas land if I get to live forever. And, you know, if, if yeah. the alternative was having abuse. The good abused. news for you is Charlie's waiting outside. He'll take <laughs> so you I'm later. Just curious about that origin of that character and the wraith. Say that again? Uh, curious about the origin of that character, the seed of Christmas Land, the Wraith, and uh, Manx. I live in a I live in a you know a seacoast town in New Hampshire that has an old car show every weekend, and um, I saw a uh, a gray 1950s car with sloopy bathtub styling, and the license plate said something like "Gray Ghost." Not exactly because that's too long for a license plate, but it was somehow. They had configured the letters so it spelled Grey Ghost. And I thought, I would never get in the back of that car. <laughs> yes? Yeah. So the question is, what's the difference between writing comic books and writing novels? And the difference is that writing comic books is a lot of fun and writing novels is really hard. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So, so the, my primary comic, I've got a whole bunch of new comics coming out, including this one, um, Basket Full of Heads, which is probably my most tasteful title of all time. Um, the, the, you know, I cut my teeth writing a comic uh, called Lock and Key that I worked on with my soul brother, Gabriel Rodriguez, um, who illustrated every single page. Um, and and uh, we're like an old married couple. You know, like we finish each other's sentences and stuff. Gabe literally designed my wedding ring. 
Um, so, um, you know, the, to, to go back to the question actually about what's the difference between novels and comics is that writing novels is a very lonely business. You sit by yourself in a room for several hours every day for months or years listening to the voices in your head like a crazy person. You know, and when you're working on a comic, it's like, it's like being in a band. It's like being in the Stones. You know, it's like I'm like the drummer and, and Gabe is the guitarist and we're like kind of out to impress each other. Chris Ryle, our editor, is like George Martin in the recording studio. He has to cut our self-indulgent seven-minute shit down to like three minutes of pop perfection. You know, and, and, and so, so like I would write something and then Gabe would do an illustration that was beyond my wildest dreams of what it could be. And then that would stoke me up, so I'd want to write something awesome for him. Um, and so that's kind of, that's how good comics get made, is this sort of virtuous cycle where you're trying to make each other happy. I can toss these lightly, in the, lightly towards you, but I'm a little worried that like someone will be blinded, so <laughs> protect yourselves at all costs, but yeah, okay. That was not a good throw, I'm real sorry. <laughs> If Better? I think we have sorry, enough time for hurt? two more questions. I'm so sorry. Let's have another one. Let's have another one. There's a lot more of these. I'm really... <laughs> we could be here all night. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah. Sorry. Um, how do you keep track of all of that, and did you intend to do that when you started writing? You know, so the question is, is how do you, you know, all the stories seem to take place in the same world, and how do you keep track of that? Um, the, um, it, my answer to that is, is, is actually so, sort of almost ask a different question, you know, or answer a different question. But I was, I was thinking about shared universes, you know, because everyone seems to really love shared universes. I think that's part of the appeal of the Marvel films is that all these characters are intertwined and cross each other's paths and have relationships. I think that some of the, some of the reason there's been this burst of popularity around my dad's films in the last decade is the sudden, you know, the, the directors and filmmakers have suddenly started to figure out, you know, how they could work to be really fun. And part of it is that they all exist in the same world. You know, that, that um, the events of it, that Derry is not too far away from Shawshank prison. Um, and I think that part of the appeal of shared universes is we all carry shared universes around in our heads. Um, you know, in my brain, Spider-Man is mashed right up against Aslan from Narnia and Sherlock Holmes and, you know, Neo from The Matrix and my own characters. There's, I don't have to talk to a copyright lawyer before they have a relationship. You know, they're just sort of swirling around there um, in this same shared universe. Um, and so I just think it's kind of natural for, for characters from one story um, to meet another. My screen agent is less wild about it when, you know, a story f f that's already been licensed by a filmmaker, you know, a character turns up in another story and then we have to fight about whether or not um, the previous buyer gets to keep the, but that's commerce, not art. Right. We have enough time for one more okay, question. Okay, we can have a couple more. Um, right on the aisle, um, in a, is it, it's like, yeah, right, right, yeah. Hi, um, my question is um, about researching yeah. for a genre. When does the research end and the writing begins? When when does the research end and the writing begin? Yes, yeah, such as for a historical fiction novel or maybe. Oh a yeah. Um, so I've generally tried to avoid research because that just feels so much like work. You know, it's like homework. I'd prefer to just make shit up. Um, I, nevertheless, so I'm writing these three new comics. Uh, there's Basket Full of Heads. There's another comic called Plunge. And then they're all part of this imprint, Hill House Comics. And every issue is going to have a backup feature in it called Sea Dogs, which is about how we won the Revolutionary War using werewolves. <clears throat> which, when you think about it, is the only thing that really makes sense. Um, and... and it, it sort of grew out of my love of the Patrick O'Brien sailing adventures. And I read a ton of, you know, historical writing about naval warfare during the time of the Revolutionary War. And even to the point where I even went to the, you know, British Naval History Library and I was, I had, you know, I, I was, I'm reading and transcribing a journal um, 
you know, uh, that was written in the 18th century. I mean, it was the actual thing, too. It wasn't even a facsimile. You know, this guy's beautiful copper plate. And, um, you know, but at the end of the day, it is a story about um, uh, werewolves on a boat. So, I mean, like, you know, and you have a deadline. So I guess the, the question is, when do you stop researching and start writing when the deadline is breathing down your neck? In the glasses? Yeah, you, right there? Yeah, you. I can try to throw this, but I'm worried someone... No, no, you, 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 you uh, ma'am? Uh, yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you know right away whether or not a novel or a short, oh, or a short story... Um, do you have a preference? Between short stories and novels, and do and I do know? do you feel you can choose? Yeah, I mean, the answer is I don't really know. Sometimes I have strong ideas, but I don't. The, the job is always the same. You know, you, you take a character who is a little bit of an unsolved mystery, someone we want to spend some time with and find out more about, and then you put that character under into terrific peril. Um, and under the pressure, the unrelenting pressure of some threat, they cough up the truth about themselves. They reveal parts of themselves that otherwise they could have kept hidden. And so that's kind of my, it's like trying to crack a geode. That's kind of my job is to keep the pressure up until the geode cracks and we can see what's inside. Um, and, and I never know how long that's going to take. It might take 30 pages. It might take 300. Um, I often have intuitions. Um, but sometimes they're wrong. I mean, Heart Shaped Box started as my, you know, my first novel started as a short story that was going to go into 20th Century Ghost. And I started writing it. And, you know, I had this idea that, that Jude would buy the ghost online, realize he had made a terrible mistake, but it would be too late and would eat him for breakfast, you know, in 30 pages. And that would be the end. And instead, it was kind of like Jude was like this cockroach. You know, I'd... <sighs> stomp on him and then I'd lift my foot and he'd scuttle away again and it started to get fun you know chasing him around and 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 you know I wanted to see how many times he could get back up and how long he could run it turned out he could run for 327 pages <laughs> um, we'll have two or three more uh, you sir right there is that Joe yeah. hey Joe go ahead what's your question My favorite breed of dog and why, uh, uh, Welsh Corgis, Pembroke Welsh Corgis. My family bought uh, their first Corgi when I was like nine years old. Poor old epileptic Bill who died on Christmas Eve, um, which explains everything you need to know about Nosferatu. Um, um, and, and the family's had Corgis ever since. Um, my dad has a Corgi um, named Molly, the thing of evil, who is actually more, has more Instagram followers than he does. Um, um, I have a dog, the distinguished, the furry distinguished gentleman, McMurtry, who is actually Molly's like uncle once removed or something. They are, they are related. So uh, corgis are uh, the little dog with the big dog heart. We'll do two more if they're kind of fast, and then I'll, I'll let you, everyone will be free. Yes, ma'am? Yes, you? Me? Oh. Yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, do you know what you're being for Halloween this year? Do I know what I'm going to be for Halloween this year? Um, uh, a tired writer at the end of a book tour. <laughs> Good creep show shirt. One more question. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I actually wanted to ask a question about adaptation. Whether you write the adaptations of your works or somebody else does, and how, and if you want to be involved or would rather not be involved. So the, the, the question is, um, what I want to be, do I work on the adaptations or not? Um, usually, by the time I finish um, working on a book, I'm so fucking sick of all of them uh, that I can't wait to pass it off to someone else if they want to make a film out of it. Um, I did, there was one exception, um, which is um, I did the script of The Fireman because I kind of fell in love with the two protagonists, John and Harper, and was eager to spend a little more time with them. But for the most part, you know, I do my version of the story, and then I'm ready to, if someone else wants to play with it, I'm happy to step back and see what their version looks like. Um, if it's great, it will reflect glory on my story. <laughs>
And if it's terrible, people will say, boy, that really sucked. I guess I better read the book and find out what was, why they decided to make that into a film after all. Um, so it's win-win no matter what. Um, I, am, I am the big winner tonight. Uh, you guys have been marvelous, um, and I've terrifically enjoyed being up here and blabbing at you. I am going to be signing somewhere, right? In the next room, maybe? Yes, in the cafe. So I'll be in the cafe. Um, anyone who is um, uh, uh, disabled or here with small children or pregnant should proceed right to the front of the line. No waiting for you. Um, and I will, um, if you have more than three books to sign, I would ask you to wait till the end um, because there may be people here who just want full throttle signed and then need to get home and let the babysitter off. My understanding is that babysitters go forty-seven fifty an hour in Brooklyn um, if you can find a cheap one. Um, so uh, so um, thanks so much, folks. You are released.